Look up the word crazy in the dictionary and you might just find an asterisk beside the definition that says, listen to the Subiquitous podcast featuring Sue Duffield and you'll find out what crazy means. Sue's travelogue journey of unfiltered stories, impossible miracles, and faith-filled fun will be revisited right here. So buckle up and let's get going with this humorous travelogue of an unfiltered saint, Subiquitous. In Joel chapter 1, verse 3, it says, Tell your children about it in the years to come, and let your children tell their children. Pass the story down from generation to generation. This week at America's Keswick, Jeff and I were so privileged to be a part of this incredible ministry of not only events and conferences, but also the Colony of Mercy and Barbara's Place, which help young men and young women who suffer from addictions to get help. And so what we would hear during the conference were incredible recovery stories of these men and women. And I'm telling you, when they were sharing their stories, (laughs) I was deeply moved. I remember wiping my eyes several times as they shared some difficult experiences as children. And also while being raised by mothers and fathers who basically didn't care about them. That was hard to hear. It's also no wonder they turned to alcohol and drugs to deaden the pain of abandonment. However, there were a few stories where parents did the right thing, and even though their children took a hard journey, mom and dad, you did the right stuff. But somehow, some way, they were still challenged by their teenagers as they experimented and went out of the series of trying to test the water, so to speak, maybe out of boredom or maybe feeling insignificant, or maybe even by peer pressure, I don't know. But it was the stories that I'll never forget. Such great stories by these men from the Colony of Mercy. Stories of forgiveness. Stories of hope. And even for Barbara's Place women, stories that give them a chance to start over again. And I kept thinking to myself, one day, when and if they already have children, or if they're going to have children in the future, if they have them on their own, they're going to need to tell their children, how God miraculously changed their lives. You know, I was aware when my great aunt Ruth passed away that the Crane family stories all left us too. I mean, my aunt Ruth went to her grave (laughs) with some stuff that we probably would love to know, but maybe we shouldn't know. But there were a lot of things that aunt Ruth, as the last of that generation, went on to be with Jesus. A lot of stories that I wish that I knew about my grandmother. I wish I knew about my great-grandfather. Grandparents' Day is coming up very soon. And it was always a fun day in our kids' school life. I'll never forget it. One highlight of one grandparents' day was when the students interviewed their grandparents on what school was like for them when they were their grandchild's age. Oh my goodness, was that fun. The antidotes, you know, shared by the grandparents, they never failed to dazzle and even downright befuddle some of these cute grandkids. Well, you know what? This is what I'm thinking about for this particular episode. There's no need to wait until Grandparents' Day to amaze and entertain, as well as enlighten and educate. Grandchildren with stories of not only your past, but of their past too. Children of all ages are fascinated by family history. Whether or not you want to believe it or not, I know it says (laughs) the culture doesn't want anything to do with it, but that's not true. They relish glimpses of who grandmom and grandpop were before they became, well, grandmom and grandpop, or in our case, mom-mom and pop up. The same is true of stories highlighting mom and dad too as youngsters. And most of all, though, children never, ever tire of tales featuring them as the main character. Sharing family history through stories provides children a positive connection to the generations that came before them. I mean, they will go through their whole life thinking about how they were formed. Though each family has unique experiences worth passing along, here are six stories we all have to share. Number one. Find your plan. How you met your partner in grandparenting. Now, this story serves as a genesis for your family, the reason for all stories that follow, making it the natural spot to begin sharing family history. Were you and your spouse school buddies? 
Was it love at first sight? What made you nervous? What made you laugh? (laughs) I mean, grandchildren are going to appreciate not only your words, but the nostalgic gleam in your eye as you recall young love. Now, they might be a little too young right now to think about it, but later, as they get to be teenagers, they'll either roll their eyes or they'll be laughing out loud. They love to hear about the day the grandchild's parent was born. First comes love, then comes marriage, then comes the grandchild's mommy or daddy and the baby carriage, right? (laughs) Tell your grandchild all about the glorious day her parent arrived in the world. You know, minus any frightening tales of being in labor, of course, but considering mommy and daddy as a wrinkled and wailing yet oh-so-adorable infant will surely make any child smile. We already started doing this. Our third grandson is a spitten image of our daughter. And already we're showing his older brother, Nolan, look at this picture of your mommy. Doesn't that look like Hudson? (laughs) And already he's getting it. Talk about fun. Talk about adorable. This is the day that matters more than any other to a child. The day the grandchild was born. Sure, they've heard the story from mom and dad's perspective, but hearing it from mom, mom, and pop, pop is a whole different ball game. Were you in the room when the grandchild entered the world, or were you miles away? Did you use FaceTime to talk about the baby when it was born? Did you laugh or cry with joy? I cannot wait to show my grandsons the FaceTime that we have as a recording of the day that they were born. And how was it the first time you cuddled that newborn baby? What did it feel like? What I loved more than anything was watching Jeff weep like a little child, (laughs) holding Nolan for the first time, or holding Jameson and Hudson for the first time, of course. Another thing to talk about with your grandkids is school days. You know, once a child begins kindergarten all the way up through the college years, school makes up the bulk of their experiences. Well, how about sharing your own experiences related to teachers and classmates that you loved or detested? (laughs) Maybe even subjects that you didn't do well at or extracurricular activities. I can't wait to tell my grandkids how many sports I played in high school. Why was your favorite teacher your favorite? Tell them, did you walk to school or ride a bus? And as lunchtime continued to be a favorite part of the school day, what was the midday meal that you liked the best? Don't laugh at me, but I loved Fridays. I'll tell you why. Friday in high school? I can't wait to tell my kids this. And my grandkids. Friday's lunch was fish sticks, mashed potatoes, and stewed tomatoes. Everybody's going, oh, gag. (laughs) But that was one of my favorite things. I can't wait to tell them. You know, it continues. Some things were likely different back in your school day. Maybe you didn't have uh, a hot lunch like we did on Friday. But you got to share with them the message of what you felt when you're eating those fish sticks. (laughs) Talk about your favorite job or the first job that you've ever had. You know, an early work experience provides far more than money for movie tickets or coveted clothing parents can't provide. You know, first jobs help teach responsibility and new skills, a a sense of purpose and an understanding of the world outside our homes and more often than not, provide some of the first non-family role models in a young adult's life. Grandchildren who will soon seek employment from either babysitting or lawn mowing jobs or post-college careers will especially relate to stories from mom mom and pop up or grandma and grandpa on how they navigated the business world for better or for worse. I can't wait to tell them that one of my coveted jobs that I loved more than anything in the world was picking strawberries at Rossidi's farm. <laughs> now, did I get paid a lot for that? No. But I sure did bring a whole ton of strawberries home. And God only knows how many pounds I ate before I even got home. (laughs) Talk to your grandkids about your proudest moments. Pride in oneself, it is a powerful and positive tool, and there's no easier way to encourage that in children than by sharing those moments where you felt good about yourself from your past. Are your proudest moments tied to maybe a creative pursuit or related to service to your family or your community or even to your country? One of my favorite things that I can't wait to tell my grandsons about 
is their great-grandfathers who served in military service. My dad in the Navy, I can't wait to tell them that their great-grandfather was in the Navy during the Korean conflict. Telling those stories to my grandsons, perhaps a moment of maybe realizing your own personal power when resisting peer pressure. They'll need to know this. They need to know that grandmom and mom and pop suffered a lot of stuff. Maybe we didn't have iPhones and we didn't have the internet. We didn't have all the crazy stuff, but we sure had peer pressure in a different kind of way. Or maybe accepting responsibility. Or maybe even being sent to the office like I was several times for talking too much in school. (laughs) Oh man, maybe I shouldn't tell them that. Or overcoming a challenge of some kind. You know, sharing these moments leads a child to consider similar moments she should or could or he could be proud of. And then, of course, reading books with the little ones make for treasured story times. I'm proud of my son-in-law. He has read books from the day that both Nolan and Jameson came home from the hospital. He has read them books at nighttime. They may not understand. They may not even have a clue. But it's given them an early start into loving to read books. So the next time your grandchild requests a story, though, share a personal tale from the heart instead of from a book. (laughs) I'm known to make up stories. I love this part. You know, family narratives engage a, a grandchild far beyond just bedtime. They entertain and enlighten your grandchild for a lifetime. So here's a couple of tips that might help you. Maybe you're a new grandparent, or maybe you have someone that you're close to that you'd like to relate with, or maybe there's a new family in church that you attend and you'd say, wow, I'd sure like to connect with those kids. Well, As we know through the attraction theory, people are attracted to fun people. So I say to all the senior saints out there and all of you that are grandparents, have fun and don't act your age. (laughs) Humor helps people connect, especially when you tell a story about yourself. Everyone needs to be able to laugh at himself or herself now and then, and you can model that for your family. So guess what? I have no problem having fun, and I have no problem not acting my age. And number two, share your story instead of lecturing to make a point. Now, I had to talk to myself about this one, because the truth is, when I'm telling a story, there's always some sort of underlying lecture going on. So I have to stop that. So you got something great to share with, rather than instruct your audience. People are more open when the lesson is just more subtle. Another thing, too, is move your face and use your voice. I used to work with young children back in the day, and I noticed they especially loved listening to one of my coworkers. And when asked why that was, they replied, well, she moves her face when she talks. (laughs) Yeah, she did. She exaggerated her facial expression, but yet she spoke softly and loudly. And and you could tell the story, it grabbed the people's attention. So it obviously will grab a child's attention. Another thing, too, is by using props and tools, such as pictures and music and even keepsakes. Stimulate your family's imagination by using any object nearby as a prop. It's another thing that I have no problem with. But build the fantasy. Stories don't always have to be totally realistic. And by far the best thing is... Always, always address tough topics through story. There are many subjects that are difficult to talk about, especially for children. But don't be afraid to talk about fears and challenges through stories, about making choices and what happens as a result. And always remember that the attention span isn't quite as large as yours. A good story can vary from a short anecdote to a nightly bedtime story with many segments. But the key is to match the length of your story to the attention span of your audience. I want to throw something in right here, but I better not. But I'm going to tell you, sometimes even the older saints, the attention span isn't there. Sometimes less is more. John Maxwell talks about that, and everyone communicates few connect in his book. You don't have to overtell your story. Get to the point. And especially with children, listen. Give them a chance to share their stories too, and they will be more receptive to yours. Storytelling is an exchange. It's not a one-way street. Enjoy the stories you hear and the ones you tell. 
document your family stories. I'm doing that every time I do an episode, it seems, on the Subiquitous podcast. I have made it an amazing journey of digital storytelling. I'm not wasting any time. Not every episode is a story about my family, but you can be guaranteed all the way through to 119, there are little bits and pieces of segments of my family's story that one day down the road digitally, my grandkids will have. My kids and grandkids will have a history of all the audible stories that one day might mean the world to them. I hope so. You know, our children begin to define themselves at a very, very young age, and the search for identity intensifies as they approach adolescence. And like all of us, our children will default to finding their identity in what others think or expect, defining themselves by performance or status or in their own passions or desires or dreams or goals. But what if they define themselves by what the Bible says? What our children and ourselves need most is to know and believe the truth about who we are in Christ. You may not always get an open door with that, but you can find a few tips on how to share the gospel with your grandkids, along with a few follow-up questions that might be helpful here. I always say this, and I'm already preparing. I tell my grandsons, whether or not their parents can hear them or not, I tell them, Nolan, Jameson, and even little baby Hudson, it's only five months old, you were created in God's image. I whisper that in their ears. God created everything, but only human beings are made in his own image. We're made to be like God and live in relationship with him. God knows us best because he carefully formed every tiny detail of our bodies and our minds. And he made each of us just the way he wanted. (laughs) We are all remarkably and wonderfully made. And he planned out all our days before we were even born. Ask those questions. Look at yourself in the mirror. What do you see? What do you think God sees? You know, think about the people in your life, your family, your church, your community, your school, whatever, your job. What difference does it make when you think of them as individuals wonderfully made by God in His image. That's what I plan to do. And number two, I say this, I whisper this. <laughs> Jesus loves you, Jameson. Jesus loves you, Nolan. Jesus loves you, Hudson. I do all sorts of things to try to make myself lovable. <laughs> you know, to be smart enough or funny enough or pretty enough or sing enough, you know, all those things that people want me to do. But you know what? God proved His love for me when He sent His only Son. That's all I need. He loved me when I was his enemy. We couldn't possibly earn God's love, but he gave it to me freely. And he keeps on loving me and you no matter what. So I ask these questions as they get older. Do you think you're a lovable person? Why or why not? Why do you think God loves you? Do you think of one person that you might struggle to love? How can God's love for you enable you to love that person? And number three, I whisper this, God forgives you and he makes us brand new. These are good things to whisper into the ear of a teenager. God loves you. So when Jesus died on the cross, he took our sin and our guilt and the condemnation on himself. And when we put our faith in him, He gives us his perfect, clean righteousness instead. When God looks at you, he sees not a dirty, guilty sinner, but the likeness of his own perfect son. You've been made new. Your heart has changed. These are good things to whisper into that teenager's ear or even text them if you can. When you trust Jesus, you can confess your sins to God and to others without fear because you are forgiven by Jesus. Texting your teenage grandchildren. Number four, you could say this. Nothing will ever separate you from me, and nothing will ever separate you from God. Each one of us, dearly loved and cherished by our perfect Father, we have an adoption that cannot be explained. Nobody can take us away from Him, and nothing can ever separate them from his love. I know so many grandparents right now who are struggling with the separation with their grandchildren. It's important somehow, some way, maybe by note or a text 
or FaceTime or email or whatever it takes to share a special family bond with that grandchild, even if they don't respond. Do you know how many grandparents I talk to who say they never hear from their grandchildren? You know what I say back? Keep doing it. Don't ever quit. As a child of God, know that your heir, that you're sharing the love of Jesus with, don't you ever, ever quit sending them messages, sending them notes. We don't know. We have no clue what God is going to do. And I think about the grandparents of the world right now that are somehow not able to have connection with their grandkids. Just keep doing it. Love them with the love of Christ. This episode I know is a little unique. And it all started this past week at America's Keswick when I heard the incredible legacy stories of men and women who have gone through Colony of Mercy Addiction Center, as well as Barbara's Place. And Jeff and I sat there. First of all, I'm thinking to myself, thank you, God, for Patrick. I now have his picture. And I'm praying for Patrick every day. He has struggled with addiction. He has struggled with lying and deceitfulness. So now I pray for him, even though he's not my son. I pray for him as if he is. I also pray for several of the gals that I met at Barbara's place. And a few of them are young enough to be my granddaughters. And I whispered in their ear as I left the grounds at America's Keswick. I whispered in their ears and I said, I plan to hear great things about your life. Because know this. You have an adopted grandmother that is praying for you in Tennessee. How does the truth of what Jesus did for us keep us humble? Well, we know that it's all Him. How does the truth keep us from wallowing in guilt? Because it all comes from Him. The Bible tells us to forgive others as we have been forgiven. Knowing how much God has forgiven us, how should we treat other people? by whispering in their ear, saying, I'm telling you my story, and my story is this. The greatest of all came into my life as a young person. I have been transformed by the power of His Holy Spirit. And because He did it for me, guess what? He can do it for you. Call up those grandkids. Get the stationery out. Write a card. Send them a text. And if they're too little yet, Grab them and whisper in their ear and say, you have been divinely made in the image of God, and I'm here for you. I plan to tell you my story forever. Thank you for tuning in to Subiquitous Podcast, episode number 119. And we are going strong. What a great new fall that is coming. A lot of super guests that we will have on this podcast in the next several weeks. We thank you for getting on SueDuffield.com and also being a part of our ministry. By your gifts and your monetary gifts of giving, you have kept us going around the world. Not only just, I wouldn't call it preaching, but sharing the gospel of Jesus to people that you would not even believe. From Ecuador to Iran to India and even Kansas City, Missouri. (laughs) Have a blessed week and we will see you next time.